I know that my Redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I have long admired this young man. The first time I heard him preach when he was in Tuskegee. I had heard about him before then, and I've always been impressed, not just with his ability, but with his Christianity. Impressed because of where he came from, a church that has, that has been known for a long time as one of those stable churches, the whole straight church of Christ in Montgomery. And we are thankful to have Brother Cameron Freeman with us as our guest speaker for today. Once again, we uh, reiterate that we count it a great, a great privilege uh, to be with you all uh, for this homecoming um, meeting. Uh, we're thankful for the invitation once again. Uh, a few more faces here at the 11 o'clock hour, so we're just thankful to God once again, my family and I, um, for the invitation to be here with you all. We're thankful to God for safe passage, and we hope, trust, and pray um, as the Casita Road congregation continues to preach the gospel in this area, in this community. May God's richest blessings uh, be upon you, your preacher, a good friend of mine, Brother Glasgow, the eldership here, the deacons, and all of the wonderful members here at the Casita Road Church of Christ, and also my good friend who's no longer here, Brother, Brother Cantrell. Um, and so it's just a wonderful, uh, part, a wonderful feeling to be a part of this, this congregation. A wonderful thing happened in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is attending to his father-in-law Jethro's flock. Jethro is the priest of Midian, and so at this particular time, Moses has fled um, Egypt because he has killed a man. And so while he is um, fleeing, um, he, he meets Jethro's, one of Jethro's daughter, he marries, marries her, and now he is working for his father-in-law being a shepherd. And what happens on the backside of the desert here is a very interesting thing. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, God gets Moses' attention with a sight unlike anything we've ever seen. While Moses was on the backside of the desert attending to his father-in-law's flock, the Bible says there was a bush that was burning, but it was not consumed. And so because of this, and it got Moses' attention, God will use this occasion to speak to Moses. But what is interesting is that here's a bush that is burning, a bush that is on fire, but it's not being consumed. And you know, many times when they show um, out in California, out west, when they show those wildfires and how those uh, wildfires ravages those trees and forests, why? Because they consume everything that the fire touches. But when you look at Exodus chapter 3, here's a tree, a bush that is burning, but it's not being consumed. And so as a result of that, God gets Moses' attention and he tells Moses, I want to use you to be the one to go and deliver my people out of Egyptian bondage. What's interesting, when you get to verse number 13 and 14, Exodus 3, 13 and 14, Moses asked God a question. And when I come to the children of Israel and tell them that the God of your fathers has sent me, they're going to ask the question, who is he? What is his name? Is he the one who sent you to deliver us from Egyptian bondage? And so Moses wants to know, when I go back to deliver them, who should I tell them is responsible for sending me to deliver them? And God says, I tell you what, you just tell them I am that I am. God says, that's who you tell them. You tell them I am that I am sent you, I am. When you look at this phrase, I am that I am, this phrase means God is the self-existing one. That simply means God does not need anybody for his existence. 
God's existence does not depend on Cameron Freeman. It does not depend on Cathedral Road Church of Christ. It does not depend on humanity. It does not depend on creation. God does not need anybody for his existence. In order for me to exist, my mother and my father had to bring me into the world. But God's existence is not dependent on anybody else. God is the self-existing one. And so God says, I am that I am. We understand I am means existence. In 1968, there was a garbage strike in Memphis, Tennessee that brought Martin Luther King to the city of Memphis. And when he got to the city of Memphis, those men who were striking, who worked for the Memphis City Sanitation Department, they had signs and t-shirts that said, I am a man. They were saying, recognize my existence recognized me to be a man, and so they understood that they were men. I am a man. So the phrase, I am that I am, implies existence. And so God is saying, I am the true God. I am the living God. I am that I am. That's who will send you to Egypt to deliver my people. Even so much so that Jesus picks up on this in, in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 22, three things happen to Jesus in one day. Jesus is visited by three of his enemies, the Herodians in Matthew 22, 15, the Sadducees in Matthew 22, 23, and also the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. But while Jesus is talking with the the Sadducees, remember now, according to Acts 23, 8, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection or angel or spirit. And so the Sadducees come to Jesus with a proposition. They say, well, uh, according to the Leverett Law, there was a, a man who was married, and he died. And then according to the Leverett Law, his wife, who remains alive, she is supposed to marry his brother. And so they asked Jesus a question, well, the first man, he lived, he died. Then she married his brother, and then he died. And then she married the third brother, and then he died. And so, you know, when you start reading, it becomes kind of comical. Because they asked Jesus, well, you know what, well, seven brethren had her, according to the liberal law. Now, you think about that. Now, here's a woman who I live, seven husbands, seven brothers. Now, the first brother could have died by accident. The second brother could have died because of old age. But now if I was the third brother, <laughs> I got to start asking some questions. And so what are we having for dinner tonight? It depends what you cook it. Because the text says, she outlived all of them. And so the Sadducees said, well, in the resurrection, whose husband will she be? Who, whose wife will she be? She outlived, outlived all seven brothers in the resurrection. Jesus says, you do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. In the resurrection, they shall neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels. And Jesus says, haven't you read the scripture? Back in Exodus chapter 3, what God says, I am that I am. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And so what ends up happening is this. As we understand this phrase, I am that I am, what's going to happen in the ministry of Jesus Jesus will use several I am statements to prove his existence, but also his deity. If you will, let's turn to the Gospel of John. John chapter 8. We're going to go through John chapter, the, the Gospel of John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Now I want you to notice verse 58. John 8, 58. Jesus picks up on this statement in Exodus chapter 3. And notice what Jesus says. John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. 
Jesus says before Abraham came into existence, before he was ever born, I was around. Jesus says before Abraham was, I am. Now notice what Jesus does not do. Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He didn't say that. He said before Abraham was, I am. You see, if he would have said I was, that means Jesus would have had a beginning like Abraham. But Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And you know the Jews, they picked up on what Jesus was saying. They said, wait a minute. Are you trying to say? I mean, really, what are you trying to say? Better yet, Jesus, you died even 50 years of age. What are you talking about before Abraham was, I am? You don't even have an AARP card. You're not even old enough to talk like that. But what Jesus was trying to give them to understand was, before Abraham was, I existed. What you have to keep in mind when John writes his gospel, John wants the world to know that Jesus is deity. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And so John 1, 1 through 3, and eventually John 1, 14 shows us that Jesus is deity. So when Jesus makes these I am statements, you need to understand he is picking up where his father left off in Exodus chapter 3. The first I am statement is in John chapter 6 and verse 35. John 6, 35, Jesus tells those Jews after they saw the feeding of the 5,000 with the five loaves, I mean, the, the, the two loaves and uh, uh, two fish and five loaves, Jesus tells them, I am the bread of life. That's the first I am statement. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Now, this is on the heels of seeing this miracle. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. Now, what happens many times on the first day of the week, on Sundays, usually like today, aside from homecoming, you know, we come to worship, we go to Bible study, and then we go find somewhere to eat. We usually go to one of several places. We may go to Olive Garden. You know, you go to Olive Garden, they got those wonderful garlic bread sticks, do they not? You go to Red Lobster, they got, got those wonderful biscuits with the cheese in them, do they not? You go to Cracker Barrel and they got wonderful bread. But let me tell you something. Olive Garden, Red Lobster, Cracker Barrel, any restaurants you go to, don't have the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life, John 6.35. And Jesus was trying to impress upon them, you need me more than physical bread. I am the bread of life. The next I am statement, John 8 and verse number 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 9, 5, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Can you imagine how morally bankrupt and corrupt the world would be if Jesus had not come into the world. You think about all of the things Jesus taught, all the things he did when he came, and Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. We have had great men and women who've lived, who've come, and who've gone, but none are like Jesus. Great leaders, great philosophical thinkers, great minds, great technological advances, but none of those men can lay claim to being the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. If, you can, if your mind can grasp for just a moment, imagine where the world would be if Jesus had not come into the world. He is the light of the world. And what light does, you see what light does, if we were to cut off all the lights in this building, cover up all the windows, what light does, light dispels darkness. And so Jesus came to dispel sin and the problems of this life. He is the light of the world. That's the second I am statement. But then, in John chapter 10, verse number 9, John 10, 9, the third I am statement, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheepfold. If any man come in by me, he will be saved. Do understand now, there's only one door. There's not a whole lot of doors. 
Not a lot of different exit doors. You know, you look at this building, if you want to leave here, if there's an emergency, you got an exit door here, exit door there, exit door here. But Jesus says, I am the door. He is the only door to God. He is the door of the sheep. And if you want to go to God, you got to go through that door, his door, the door. He is the door of the sheep. As a matter of fact, if you stay in John chapter 10, Jesus will say, using the imagery of sheep, Jesus will say that God has but one fold. And Jesus is the door of that fold. And what's interesting in John chapter 10 and verse number 16, Jesus says, All the sheep I have which are not of this fold, them must also bring, they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold. John 10, 16, Jesus says, There shall be one fold. He is the door of the fold. Well, what's the fold? Paul answers the question in Ephesians chapter 4, when he says, There is one body. Jesus says there shall be one. Paul says there is one. So when you look at it, there's one fold, one body of believers, Jew and Gentile. And the only way that you can have that, you got to go through the door, which is Jesus Christ. No other door. The problem with people in religion today is they want many doors. They want all kind of doors to get to God, but there's only one door. If you stay there in John chapter 10, the next I am statement is in verse number 11. What Jesus says in John chapter 10 and verse number 11, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. All who came before me were robbers and thieves. You think about all of the false teachers, all of the false prophets, all of the false shepherds. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Imagine how comforting that was to the Jews to understand and to know and to have reassurance and knowing that there was a shepherd that they could trust. Now you got to keep this in mind now. You got to think about our ancient uh, uh, Palestinian geography. One of the most common occupation was being a shepherd. And so Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He's going to take care of the sheep. He's going to lead the sheep. He is going to guide the sheep. He is going to protect the sheep. He is going to provide for the sheep. Why? Because he is the good shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The next statement, the next I am statement in the Gospel of John, John chapter 11, verse number 25. You remember Jesus had to comfort Mary and Martha. Remember now their brother, Lazarus, had died. And both Mary and Martha, if you read the text carefully, John chapter 11, they kept saying, Jesus, if you was here, he wouldn't have died. If he was here, if you were here, Jesus, he wouldn't have died. The point that Jesus makes in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. What Mary and Martha and what most folks don't understand today, I don't have to be there. Because I am the resurrection and the life. Even when, even when I was not there, I can still raise Lazarus from the dead. You see, Jesus didn't have to be there because he has the power to raise Lazarus from the dead, although he was not there. What is interesting, John chapter 11, Jesus waited four days before he went and saw Lazarus. By the time he went to go see Lazarus, the Bible says Lazarus was stinking. He prolonged the time that he could have went. He could have went the first day, could have went the second day, could have went the third day, but he waited four days. Why? To show them that he is the resurrection and the life. And you know what's interesting? When he raised Lazarus from the dead, when you get to John chapter 12, verse number 9, because many people believed on Jesus because he raised Lazarus from the dead, the Jews said, we ought to kill him again. Now, don't you think, if he raised him one time, he has the power to raise him again, if he's the resurrection and the life. And so they said, we'll kill him again. But guess what? His friend is the resurrection and the life. That's comforting even for us. If Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead, there are a whole lot of our family members, loved ones, brothers and sisters in Christ, people who have gone on to glory, who have died. But guess what? They're in the hands 
of the good shepherd. They are in the hands of the man who is the resurrection and the life. Believe it or not, at one day, one day, according to John 5, 28 and 29, all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall be raised. Jesus says, some shall be raised until to the resurrection of life, and then some shall be raised until the resurrection of condemnation. But the choice is up to you. But everybody in the grave will be raised. Why? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Have you ever thought about the fact every time you go to a funeral, and then subsequently we go to the cemetery to bury the person who died. The cemetery is a testament to the fact that God exists. Why do you say that? Way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat that fruit thereof, that forbidden fruit, dying thou shalt die. So when you see a cemetery, and we pass by them all of the time, people always want to know, how, how can you tell if God is real? How do you know God exists? Just go to the cemetery. The cemetery attests to the fact that there is a God. If there is no God, there would be no cemetery. There would be nobody to sin against. And so the cemetery proves that God is real, that God exists. But the wonderful thing about the cemetery is Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The next I am statement we know all too well, found in John chapter 14. We often read this at funeral, but it's not a funeral passage. In John chapter 14, Jesus says in verse number one beginning, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now when you back up in the context, John 13, 33 and 36, the apostles, these grown men who have been following Jesus for nearly three and a half years now, they are plagued. They don't want Jesus to die. They don't want Jesus to suffer. They don't want Jesus to go to the cross. And so when I look at John 13, 33, and 36, the apostles who these grown men, you know what that reminds me of? What happens on the first day of school when you let your children go to Head Start and kindergarten for the first time? There's separation anxiety, isn't it? They don't want to leave. They are kicking and they're screaming. Why? They don't want to leave your side. The apostles were kicking and screaming. They didn't want Jesus to leave. They didn't want him to die. But Jesus said, it's advantageous if I go away. So I got to go away. You got to let me go. So let not your heart be troubled. Believe also in me. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I know you believe in God. The Jews were taught, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, to believe that there was one Lord. Hear, O God, hear, O Israel, there is one Lord God the Jewish prayer called the Shema. And so they were taught to believe in the one God, but Jesus says, I know you believe in that. But he says, you believe in God, you need to also believe in me. In my father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. You know the wonderful thing about heaven? God has enough room in heaven for everybody. As a matter of fact, God wants everybody to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4, who have all men to be saved and to come unto a knowledge of the truth. God wants everybody to be saved. He don't want anybody to be lost. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise and some men count slack, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The problem is God wants everybody to be saved, but everybody don't want to be saved. But God has enough room for everybody. It's not like when you go to the restaurant, the restaurant says on the sign, maximum occupancy. God is not like that in heaven. Sometimes back in the day when you had to get all, all, all these motels, you would drive past the motel and the motel would say no vacancy. Heaven is not like that. God has enough room for everybody. 
So Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Here's another I am statement. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says a mouthful here. In John 14, in verse number 6, I want you to pay attention to you carefully. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Now, as I read this, I think about Jesus. I believe Jesus was from the old school. Because Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know, most of our seniors in here are from the old school. And what do I mean by that? You ever ask somebody from the old school for directions? What are they going to do? They're not going to tell you. Pull out your phone, pull up Waze, pull up Google Maps, pull up an app on your phone. What are they going to do? They're going to tell you. They're going to give you directions. They're going to give you a landmark. They're going to tell you how far to drive. And if you go too far, you may be in the right place or not the right place. So what Jesus says, I'm giving you instructions. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the life. I'm the way. Jesus says, I'm the directions. I'm the truth. I'm the landmark. And I'm the way unto God. I am also the destination. And so when you think about it, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the directions, I'm the landmark, and I'm the destination. If you want to get to God, no man can come unto the Father but by me. The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. What we must accept and what we must admit that salvation is exclusive to Jesus. You cannot get to God through nobody else, not through Muhammad, not through any other religion, not, not through Hinduism, not through Judaism, not any other ism. Jesus is the only way to God and only way to the Father. Why? Because Christianity is exclusive. Acts 4 and verse number 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. If you want to get to salvation, you want to get to God, you want to get to heaven, you got to go through Jesus. I heard several years ago, Oprah asked a question. Is Jesus really the only way to God? Yes! Absolutely. Is Jesus the only way to salvation? Yes. Is Jesus the only way to heaven? Yes, emphatically. Why? Because everybody else is sin. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so when you think about everybody else, Everybody else is sin, but only Jesus is perfect. So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man coming into the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He's the only way to God. He's the only way to salvation. We, we must accept that. And then... Jesus says in John 15 and verse number one, his last I am statement. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father the husband. What is Jesus saying in John 15 and verse number one? Jesus, I'm the true vine. My father is the husband. Man. In other words, John 15, verse number six, if you want to get to the father, Jesus says, you got to be in me, and you got to abide in me. Why all of these statements? John 6, John 8, John 10, John 11, John 14, John 15. To show us that just like God said in Exodus chapter 3, where he wanted Moses to understand, I am that I am. Jesus wants us to understand today that he is who he claimed to be. 
And so through several I am statements, Jesus will show us that he is deity. What men and women have to do today, they have to make up in their mind whether or not they're going to accept that. And so when you think about the Bible, what God shows us in the Old Testament, he shows us his person, his power, and his presence. When you get to the gospel, guess what Jesus showed us? His person, his power, and his presence. And so Exodus chapter 3 coincides perfectly with the New Testament gospel of John. The Father is I am. That's what you tell him, sent you, Moses. And Jesus says, I am, John 8, 58. This morning, are you going to recognize and accept that Jesus is who he claimed to be? Because in the 9 o'clock hour, we looked at the fact that Jesus is the Lord. Acts 2, 36. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Make no mistake about it. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus says, I am that I am. This morning, you got to accept Jesus. You got to accept the fact that he is deity. He's God's son. You know the verse that we read, John 3, 16? Many people fail to comprehend what that verse is actually saying. When Jesus says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Jews understood that when Jesus says that he is the son of God, he was claiming to be deity. Why? Because when you get to John chapter 5 and verse number 17 and 18, Jesus says, my father worketh hitherto and I work. They say, wait a minute. If you're saying God is your father, in essence you're saying you're his son, you are trying to make yourself equal to God. The problem with their thinking was they were saying Jesus was making himself the son of God, thus making himself equal to God. The problem with that thinking is they failed to remember that God had already called Jesus his son. When Jesus was baptized in Matthew chapter 3, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. At the transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 5, the Bible says, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. God is saying, yes, Jesus is my son. Yes, you need to listen to him. Yes, you need to hear him. He is my son. And then Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 6, but making himself with no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and being made in the likeness of men, Jesus was equal to God. And that's why we have these I am statements. What you see with God the Father in the Old Testament, you see of Jesus in the New Testament. God says, I am. And Jesus, in essence, says the same in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John was written so that you may believe, John 20, 30, and 31. This morning, do you believe that Jesus is the I am? I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheepfold. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world? who gave his life for the sins of the world. And so God sent his son as a demonstration of his love for us so that we could be saved. Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You gotta believe that with all of your heart. Jesus says in John 8, 21 and John 8, 24, if you don't believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. You must believe that he is who he claimed to be. And then you have to repent. Jesus says in Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay twice. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You see, a man has to repent. You have to change your mind about your relationship and your status with God. Paul says in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30, at a time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he had the point of a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man. What man? Who? The man who made all of those I am statements by that man whom he hath ordained, where he hath given the children that he raised him from the dead. Jesus being raised from the dead, you remember he said he was the resurrection and the life. Jesus being raised from the dead is assurance that we will stand in judgment before God. 
And Jesus says we have to repent. And then we got to confess and go for witnesses. Let the world that you know that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the I am. Don't be ashamed of that. Let the world know. Let people know that you believe in that. Make the same confession that the eunuch made in Acts chapter 8. And then be buried with him in the water grave of baptism for the remission of sins. We found out this morning that when you're baptized and you obey the Lord, that's how you call on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. While we stand together and sing our invitation song. In the blood, would you for evil a victory to win? That wonderful power in the blood, there is power, power, underworking power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonderworking power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power. Oh!